right, we're gonna, um, I've got quite a few slides, so we're gonna go through them kind of quickly. Um, quick introduction, the Secure the Grid Coalition is uh, sponsored by the Center for Security Policy. You guys uh, are probably familiar with my boss, Frank Gaffney. He sends his regrets uh, and, and really just uh, appreciates everything that Eagle Forum does. Our Secure the Grid Coalition and the Center for Security Policy, I just wanna direct your attention to the last bullet. We don't receive any funding from the government. We don't receive any funding from the electric utility industry or the companies that could make money by protecting the grid. This gives us a completely unconstrained analysis of this threat and we can speak the truth about it. A couple of things I want you to know. You can give Americans hope, okay? Can you see that quote at the top? Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. That's St. Augustine, okay? What we're gonna talk about today is gonna make you angry, okay? But I know there's a couple of beautiful daughters there on the left, one which is here and then mine on the right, um, that I think can make a difference. And I'm gonna show you how you can make a difference. The second thing is, I often have people say, hey, hey, thanks for your service. I appreciate that. But I wanna let you know that it's the people who keep the lights on in this country that keep the grid running who do and will do more than I've ever done in uniform or will ever do because the survival of our civilization does not depend on me as a Marine and what I do overseas or here at home. The survival of our civilization depends on this grid continuing to function. That's going to become very clear. Everything we're going to talk about you can find on the website, okay, securethegrid.com. Just want to make sure you know that. There's up on the top left a threat overview that will go over the things that we're going to discuss in great detail. So just uh, pay attention to that. All right, real quick, we're going to show a video. Just make sure you're all awake, okay? It's about four minutes long. It's going to require that I talk a little faster, but I think it'll be worth it. One of these three things will happen. There will be a cyber attack, a Carrington event, a nuclear EMP, and all three of them have essentially the same effect. They bring down the grid. You cannot sustain the population of a 21st century superpower without electricity. And unfortunately, every bad guy on the planet knows that. We're not only going to be dealing with nation states, but we're going to be dealing with groups, with individuals. That makes this really problematic. We know Mother Nature is going to do an EMP laydown in due course. These things happen roughly every 100 years. Well, we're about 160 years overdue. It's coming, folks. Congress should look at EMP attacks, cyber warfare, and nuclear weapons as three great threats to our survival. We have to be able to defeat all three of those threats. We're going in exactly the wrong direction. When the EMP Commission has already spent 17 years studying the threat, has repeatedly told Congress, this is a real threat, and we know how to protect against it. Work back from consequence, you rapidly become unreasonable because the consequences are so horrible. I gave up on trying to get institutions here in Washington to deal with this issue. I think we're living through the most dangerous period of my lifetime. This is vastly bigger than 9-11. The day before it happened would have been regarded as highly unlikely. You're talking about a catastrophic event. You take civilization back to the 1800s. Our citizens are not prepared in this country for the low to no notice big events. If you're expecting FEMA to do it, that's not a sound plan. If there will be no electricity for the next year, what will you do? Next month, we hope to finish this documentary series and potentially with your help, we can get it out there. Next slide. That video explained a little bit about the threats. We'll talk a little bit more about them briefly. The grid, so what is the grid, right? It's the entire network of technology that generates electricity, whether it's coal or nuclear or whatever the case may be. 
transmits it across long distances and then distributes it to either the industries or the homes, right? So there's different parts of it. We're not going to go into great detail. Again, on the website, securethegrid.com, there's a threat overview you can download and there's helpful videos. You see the little play button. Click that. It'll show you a whole video all about the grid. Next slide. So how can it be attacked? We're going to talk, again, the video introdu introduced some of it. Physical attack, cyber attack, electromagnetic, and solar weather. We're not going to talk at length about the adversary's capabilities and who's looking at this, but I do have it in backup slides if, if during Q&A you want to do it. Next slide. Physical attack. This is something statistically that the Department of Energy gets reports from the industry, which I'll show you later, about once a week. Somewhere in the country there's a physical attack, some sort of sabotage. It's successfully taken down grids in Mexico, Yemen, Pakistan, Colombia, and in, in certain cases, just about the United States. You may remember that the Metcalf attack in, in California, we still haven't figured out who uh, conducted that attack. Um, what FERC found, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is that a successful physical attack, like what took place in Metcalf and was almost successful, if it took place in just the right nine places in our country, could cause a blackout that could last over a year or 18 months. Next slide. Cyber attack, this is something that's taking place right now constantly. If you take a look right now at our grid, there's malware in our grid right now from Russia. This is a quote from George Cotter. George Cotter was, uh, he, he spent almost 40 years uh, in the NSA, was the chief information officer for the NSA in a statement to FERC that he made last week. The Russian Ministry of Defense has unimpeded access to the bulk power system since at least 2012. It has collected all the infrastructure information it needs to attack for access to distribution systems serving major urban and national security facilities. It has developed from those collections potent attack systems thoroughly tested in the Ukraine. Next slide. Electromagnetic attack. This is by far the most catastrophic method by which the grid can be taken down. Again, if we have more time and get into Q&A, we can talk about uh, the, the phenomenon of EMP, how we discovered it, the differences between E1, E2, and E3 components of EMP. Uh, but trust me when I say that a nuclear weapon detonated in the exo, exo atmosphere, so 30 kilometers or higher, those, that's what those rings show, will cause catastrophic damage to our grid, nationwide grid collapse. There are some that argue that, and we'll explain in just a little while why that is. What you see in the pictures here are the methods uh, on the top right that electromagnetic attack can take place at a localized level with radio frequency weapons, um, some of which were developed, that one by the Army, to see if it could be done in, in a vehicle in around 2005. And these are test kits, radio frequency test kits, uh, that in the wrong hands and directed towards the right infrastructure could cause uh, damage, at least at the local level. Next slide. So solar weather, you saw uh, my boss, Frank Gaffney, talking about uh, the phenomenon uh, of geomagnetic disturbances. Again, if we want to get into the technical aspects of how that takes the grid down, we can do it. Um, what I will share with you, though, is that the last time that the Earth experienced a massive solar storm uh, was 1859. Some of you are shaking your head. You remember probably reading about it. So the, the only infrastructure we had at the time was was our telegraph machines and the telegraph operators reported fires uh, caused from the electromagnetic energy that was traveling through that infrastructure they had to replace the entire transatlantic telegraph cable after this solar storm so you think about the infrastructure that we have today and what the effect would be if we don't protect it which i can tell you that at this time it's not protected next slide this is the effects of a solar storm. This is just the 1989 solar storm that took out uh, uh, the electricity in Quebec uh, in the northeastern section. You can see the map there, uh, the blackout that was caused. These are the windings on the insides of that extra high voltage transformer, which are essentially irreplaceable assets in the grid, uh, unprotected against these ground-induced currents. This is the type of damage that can take place, and, and those can have a lead time of well over a year uh, to replace. Next slide. So what we really face at this moment is, is uh, a watershed moment in human history. So throughout civilization's history, it always took one civilization uh, the requirement to build its, its uh, military, its economic power, agricultural power, all the as aspects of a civilization in order to overtake another. And because of our dependency on electricity, the most sophisticated civilization on Earth can be taken out by a non-civilization a single nuclear weapon in the hands of 
even a non-state actor can take out the most sophisticated civilization on earth. Next slide. Is it hard to imagine? No. I mean, there's, this is from three, four years ago. I just did screen captures of books written about this. Anybody ever read One Second After? Okay, I, I highly recommend it. It's a fictional book. Um, Dr. Forshin is, is uh, a friend of our coalition. He thoroughly researched it, and it gives you the opportunity to kind of think through what the effects would be uh, if an electromagnetic pulse attack took place here uh, in America. Next slide. So the good news is that we actually know how to defend ourselves against all of these threats, including electromagnetic pulse. Uh, the Defense Department has been doing it for decades. Our nuclear warfare, uh, our nuclear weapon systems and command and control systems are all, um, are all resilient to electromagnetic pulse. In fact, the, the men who helped develop the military's protection standards are part of our coalition. And they've looked at how to protect the grid. And in fact, uh, you, you saw before Ambassador Hank Cooper from South Carolina in that video talking about having given up on the, on the federal level. He's executing a pilot project right now in South Carolina where they found that applying the military standards of protection, the same exact standards developed to defend our nuclear weapon systems, to the grid assets, the, just the distribution grid, so that's where it gets distributed, right, in York County, South Carolina, was a one-time cost of $115 per York County citizen for just the critical infrastructure. She's talking about water, wastewater, hospitals, communications, to so the critical infrastructure of the county to protect the distribution assets that provide electricity to them, one time cost $115 per citizen. Pretty reasonable, right? Next slide. So what's been done, at least about EMP? So when it was discovered, until around the end of the Cold War, it was highly classified, which is why still we have the situation where people will unfortunately ridicule those of us that care about it and say we have tinfoil hats on. It took some time for it to come out of, uh, of the classified world, and that came with the, the Congressional EMP Commission. The first Congressional EMP Commission report was published the same day as the 9-11 Commission report. Unfortunately, it got very, very little attention. That was in 2004. The recommendations that that report provided uh, to the Congress and to the nation uh, were not taken, um, and so the, the commission met again and produced another more detailed report in 2008. Those recommendations were also ignored. The commission was reestablished uh, at the end of 2015, and the Defense Department withheld the funding and the clearances of the commission for 365 days. It was then given six months to finish its 18-month eight, charter, and it produced uh, another 14 reports uh, for the United States. Thankfully, during that period of time, uh, some of us, uh, uh, Frank, made it possible for us to have these National Security Action Summits. Uh, your mother participated in them, which we uh, are very grateful for. And it was during that time that we had the opportunity to brief numerous candidates. We, of course, invited candidates from both sides of the aisle, only so much, so many of them would, would come to our events. But one of them that came was Mr. Donald Trump, and that was, to our knowledge, the first time that he heard about electromagnetic pulse and he made the commitment to address it when he was president. That was his words, when I'm president. And he has. Uh, in his national security strategy, he, he called on the government to protect critical infrastructure against all hazards, including electromagnetic spectrum threats. That's a first, never been said before, in a national security strategy. This March, he issued an executive order that directs the federal government to coordinate resilience to electromagnetic pulse threats, both natural and man-made. But unfortunately, uh, the swamp is deep. And unfortunately, some of the people in government trying to do the right thing uh, have been targeted by that swamp. And so, for example, uh, under the leadership of President Trump, uh, a very courageous Air Force officer, Lieutenant General Stephen Quas, created something called the Electromagnetic Defense Task Force, uh, which sought to bring together the, the nation's leading experts on this phenomenon and to figure out how to address it, at least in the military. General Quas was forced to retire effective the 1st of September of this year. Next slide. So who are some adversaries uh, to action? Well, certainly Russia, Iran, North Korea, and especially China. All of them have an incentive in us maintaining a very unprotected grid. There are also those in government that are naysayers about the reality of the threat of EMP. And so, for example, take a look at this slide now. I don't know that uh, this is going to remain, um, but this was briefed at a NERC EMP task force meeting where a member in the government said that they're going to use the best available science, use physics and engineering constraints in analysis to avoid overestimation of risk. Does that sound like the scientific method? 
But there it is right there. Okay, and the, thankfully, m members of our coalition found this and pointed it out to, to people in government who I, I hope are fixing it. What you see at the bottom is another quote. This is from Elcon, the Electric Electricity Consumers Resource Council. They made this in comments to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which we'll talk about momentarily. They said, energy and security staff at the Energy Department in Capitol Hill routinely downplay or dismiss EMP concerns in private, yet the public call to address the issue remains. Why? Because I think everybody here knows this is real. Next slide. So what else is being dismissed? If you take a look right now at the reporting on physical, we're just looking at physical attack, so sabotage and cyber attacks, okay? This is really over the last nine years, since the 1st of January, 2010, the industry has reported to the Department of Energy 578 physical attacks on grid infrastructure. Yet the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which makes the rules for the utility industry in its reliability reports, has reported how many? Just one. Cyber attacks, at least 29 have been reported. Zero, according to NERC's reliability reports, which is what the public gets to see. This is a big issue that our coalition's taking on, and it's something that you're going to be able to make a difference in. Next slide. So why is that? I mean, why on earth would, uh, you know, would, there, would people put up with such a disparity? It, it, it just so happens that during that same period of time, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which makes the rules for the electric power industry, any time that the industry's members have violated critical infrastructure protection standards, so that's the standards that protect the infrastructure against sabotage, physical attack, cyber attack, the companies that violate them have remained anonymous. They've never named those companies. So what did our Secure the Grid Coalition do? We started to file Freedom of Information Act requests to disclose the entities' names. And what we found is that there are repeat violators for the same infractions. But think about it. If you are a corporate leader and you have nothing to worry about the public finding out that you're not paying attention to security, and at the same time, during that period of time, the 255 different dockets and the 1,500 Unregi un unidentified registered entities, the total number of fines that were applied by NERC to the industry equaled less than $4 million a year worth of fines across the entire electric power industry for violating those critical infrastructure protection standards. Last year alone, the industry spent $147 million in political influence and lobbying. So you do the calculation. Does it pay to pay attention to security under the current system? Absolutely not. Next slide. So how does this work? It's, it's called, it's called uh, you know, self-regulation and security through obscurity, which we're going to try to overturn. This graphic on the left shows the balance of power when it comes to the grid. Okay, that little logo on the right is FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. You can see on the left is the White House, all the intelligence. It doesn't matter what anyone in the intelligence community, the military, or even the president thinks about threats to the grid. Those who make the rules are FERC and NERC, and they have all the power. So let's take a look at how effective they have been. Who remembers the 2003 blackout, Northeast blackout? Okay, I see some hands. Some of you were probably experienced it yourself personally. That was caused by a tree branch in Ohio a single point of failure, tree branch connecting with a transmission line. Now, at the same time, they also had some serious issues um, that they couldn't have predicted where people in grid operation centers didn't have the right visibility, computer systems were messing up. But the cascading failures left some people without electricity for up to two weeks, tens of millions of customers, okay, caused by a tree branch. Now, how long do you think it took FERC and NERC to create a standard for vegetation management? guesses any guesses it is done it took it took almost 10 years that's right that's right okay so the physical security standards we're not going to get into the we're not going to get into the details of these but v we we consider them to be hollow drive down the road and look at the ehv transformers that you can see through a chain link fence and you'll realize that it's hollow the cybersecurity standards do not require the, remover, the removal of malware. 
the malware that Dr. George Cotter said is in the grid doesn't require the removal, okay? And we, we, we also believe that the solar storm standard that was created by NERC and approved by FERC is hollow. So how does this happen, right? Because we're going to talk about it with the EMP standard that's coming. How does this happen? How do we have a standard for solar storm protection that we consider to be hollow? And I say we as in the, the most authoritative experts on geomagnetic disturbances and solar weather. The Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, which is funded by the electric utility industries, studied the threat. They were able to find people in government that were able to give them the data that they wanted to model it, to produce the results that they wanted. And that's exactly how you get a solar st storm standard that's ineffective. Well, guess what's happening right now? So three years, 2016 till just recently in May, EPRI conducted a study on EMP where they found people in government willing to give them the data that they wanted to generate the results that they needed. The very week that they released their study on EMP, the NERC, NERC announced that they were creating an EMP task force to create EMP protection standards and they moved incredibly rapidly to do so. And when you look at what this EPRI research showed, remember the 2003 blackout caused by one tree branch? What they predict in that study is that the eastern interconnect would have a loss of electrical load only 40% of what that single tree branch caused. That's right, 40% load loss less from a nuclear EMP, which would cause thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of failure points instantly in the grid. That's right. That's how dangerously erroneous it is. And that's what the gut, that's, that's really what a lot of the folks in the industry are trying to look to now. Our coalition is doing something about it. Okay. Next slide. I'm going to give you something else that we can do though. This is the first time ever we've had an opportunity where we can actually move the needle. So, couple of things obviously you're going to want to educate yourself your political candidates I mean if we hadn't educated Mr. Donald Trump we may not have an executive order at this point right inspire local action you know there are coalitions at the at the state level that I help manage that are incredible and and make great progress from the bottom up but it's this last thing right here that everyone here can get involved in by the 28th of October next slide so Remember I said we did all these Freedom of Information Act requests, right? 255 to be exact, to uncover the names of all these critical infrastructure protection violators. Well, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission really doesn't want to disclose them, right? And they really don't want to go to the courts either. And so what they did is they proposed this white paper solution where they would, they would reveal the name going forward, but not back in time. And it was just the name and a couple other pieces of information Nowhere near enough information for Congress, for state utility commissioners, or for the American public to decide whether or not this regulatory process is in fact working, okay? But what they did is they asked for comments from the public, from the industry, from state public service commissioners. And this is where we can have a real effect because to get here, our coalition had 27 sets of comments, just 27, and a series of FOIA requests. We have at least double or triple that many people in this room right now. And so what you'll find is if you go to the website, securethegrid.com, and you, you click on the Take Action um, tab, you're going to see this page where I've recorded a short video about the guy that inspired this, Michael Maybe, a command sergeant major who was in six World Trade Center building when Mohammed Atta crashed into the North Tower with that airplane. And he looked over and he saw one of his colleagues in a wheelchair and knew that if he didn't get that guy eight stories down and out of that building, that he would die. And that's what he did. Pushed him three miles in a wheelchair away from the tower. And then now he credits his disabled colleague for saving his life because he knew he would have been back there. But what he watched as he left that building is he watched firemen staring up into that tower with uncertainty. And he felt that failure to imagine, right? And he's the guy that's inspiring us to make sure that we don't fail to imagine again. And I think you could probably agree with me that based on the lack of transparency that the public gets to see about the vulnerability of the U.S. electric grid, we are failing to imagine what can happen to our civilization. So I just ask all of you, again, securethegrid.com. 
the take action tab, watch the video, okay? Three steps. You're going to write your public service commissioner and your state's consumer advocates. I've made it super easy. You can click on the link and you can download a directory. I have the template for the letter. I have an information page with the template for the letter that says everything I just told you, okay? Then you can submit your own comments. You can click and download instructions on how to do it. Step one to, to done, right? All the, this would probably take less than one hour. Do you think, how many, how many here think they can do that? Okay, I'm glad to see at least the majority of the hands. All right, if you, those that didn't raise your hand, pull me aside afterwards and I'll help you walk through it. Okay, 28 October is a deadline. You can make a, a real difference, I promise. Next slide. So the last thing I'll mention is just, just don't give up, right? So this is a David and Goliath struggle, right? So there's one person like me that does this for the Center for Security Policy. And around the country, every utility has a fleet of lobbyists that are very good at what they do. Who's from Texas? Are they good at what they do? They crush it. They magnificently defeat us. Am I giving up? Absolutely not. So this man, Kotaku Wamura, he as a child witnessed in Japan, he witnessed a tsunami wipe out villages in Japan as a child. And as he grew up, he became the mayor of this small town. He, he argued that we need to have a seawall. We got to build, people ridiculed him, you know, like the tinfoil hat that we get ridiculed. You see the picture of that, right? So 2011, when that tsunami hit Japan, every life was preserved in that town because he never gave up. So despite what ridicule you may get, despite what obstacles you may encounter, don't give up. And if you need help, just let me know. I got plenty of backup slides if we have questions, but I, I don't want to go over time. <laughs>